guys, here I am at the Ancient Technology Centre in Cranbourne and I'm with Dave Stewart here who is demonstrating some prehistoric tools here. Dave, tell us what you've got here. Well, what I've got is uh, a, a bread deer antler which is used as a pick because obviously there were no metal tools for a long, long time yeah. and um, we're digging a hole to uh, recreate a Mesolithic roundhouse uh, or shelter and uh, this would have been about the only thing they've got to pick holes in the chalk which is a very slow and laborious process. I can imagine. And then of course they hadn't got shovels either so to clear up the mess they'd made they then use a cow shoulder blade, a scapula here and scoop it away. And how long would it have taken to dig a ditch in this manner? A long, long <laughs> time. They were probably far more efficient at it than, than we are, but uh, even so, yes, it would take a long time to dig a ditch. We have actually found these uh, antlers at the bottom of ditches later in the prehistoric period. So in the Neolithic um, and the Bronze Age, they were certainly used for excavating. And you were saying that they've actually found marks in the ground that have been used by these implements. Indeed, yes, yeah. the, uh, the spiky bit there leaves a nice mark in the edge of the chalk. Okay. And you can see that it's been used to lever out the chalk. This is uh, a little boggy for it, not mm. its ideal environment, but uh, hey, it works. I was originally trained using modern falconry techniques where you use a, a system called weight control, where you reduce the bird's weight, take its food away, and when the bird's hungry enough, it'll do what you want. Um, I was always taught that birds don't bond with you, they don't want to be with you, they don't love you, you should never think that they do, they're only controlled through food and they're a tool. Then we bought a historical manuscript with our passion for history and we found that historically they did exactly the opposite. So instead of taking the food away from the bird, um, you're giving the bird as much food as it could possibly eat. You keep them on your glove, you, walk, you carry them around with you 24-7, you keep them in the banqueting hall, you keep them in the bedchamber, you even take them to church with you. Eventually the bird learns, when he's on your glove you don't harm him, you protect him from external stimuli, and also you give him as much food as he can possibly eat. That way the birds can be flown in a very, very high condition without having to reduce their weight to make them fly. Um, you wouldn't really want to starve an athlete and expect him to perform in the Olympics, and it was the same with history. Um, people in history wanted them to catch large geese, heron, crane, a hungry bird, that's not feeling fit and strong would never even think of taking those. They would go for a smaller target, which would look bad on the king or the falconer. So they, they used these techniques that were mainly came from the Muslim countries and were learnt during the crusading period and brought back during the crusades to Britain and used ever since. So obviously you're dressed as somebody that's pre-Tudor. Can you tell us about uh, the relationship between the bird and the age that you are dressed at? Um, well, yes, basically I'm dressed as in sort of Beaker period, um, late Neolithic, early Bronze Age period. Um, <clears throat> now, officially, falconry started in the Roman period, according to the history books. Um, we've been on a crusade for the last 12 years to find research to prove otherwise. Um, and we think we found enough evidence to prove without a doubt that falconry was happening long before that in the UK. Um, the problem is, is the lack of equipment. It rots in the ground, so you don't really get to find any from that period. But there's been lots of grey finds of hawks, skulls and various equipment. Um, one of them was a wrist guard um, in a beaker burial and it had scratch marks on it. And it was dismissed as not being falconry related because people wear gloves. But still in the Middle East to this day, they still wear cuffs. Um, also, there was a bone toggle found that matches exactly what the Mongolian tribes people still use today to tether eagles to their belts. So this wrist guard, the toggle, and the bird's skull in the grave, it seemed, for us, is enough evidence to suggest that this was a, an, an Beaker period falconer that was buried with his bird. So these were hunters then? Falcons, um, especially in the later period, were used for political purposes. They weren't really the best hunters to bring in food for the table. It was more of a sport and an art to show off your wealth and power. Um, whereas the goshawks and the occipiters, the sparrowhawk and the goshawk, they were used for hunting predominantly. Now this bird was a goshawk skull found in this beaker burial. So it, it stands to reason that he was using that bird to hunt um, and, and bring in food for the table. And because they, we came from the, they came from the Middle East at that time and brought farming with them, did they leave falconry behind that they were already practicing out in the Middle East at that time and forget it to come to England? 
it doesn't seem likely. So, James, what period are we talking about here? So we're looking at the Neolithic here, really. Flint axes appeared prior to the Neolithic in the Mesolithic, but usually people think of a flint axe as perhaps a polished, finished example, something like this, which, after being flaked from a, a heavy, thick piece of flint and shaped into the finished article, has gone through many hours working on a grindstone or a polissoir, as they're sometimes known, but it will take about 60 hours to polish. But it makes a huge functional difference. It's not just for show, although it looks very beautiful and, and it's very tactile. As you'll see when we start working the flint, it does actually have some very functional implications about how long the axe head lasted. To start off with, rather than that large hammerstone I just showed you, we'll go with a smaller one. And you only have to work it on the sides. For these first few flakes, you're only really taking off the skin of the flint. So this area here, this is known as the cortex. It's just the contact point between the flint itself and the country rock around that. Well, I can tell that you, you need some help. Yes, so would you yeah. like me to have a go for you? Do. So <laughs> I'll show you a couple of flakes to start off with, just to give you an idea of what we're aiming to do. You saw me take that one off. You don't need a lot of power, as I said, just aim for the edges. And you can always just use your forearm just to get some flakes off. It's not a test okay. of power. Okay. So what I'll do is I'll give you this piece of leather for the hand that you're holding the flint. It's just so you don't get any flakes that stick in your hand. So just relax and just let the weight of the stone do the work. Yeah. That's it. Um, just aim for the edge. Okay. Don't be scared of it. There you go. Okay, okay. And that's a good flake. Stronger than I thought. Yeah, it's, it's not a <laughs> test of strength at all. Mm. You don't have to be He-Man to do this. You just need relatively good hand-eye coordination. Okay, and, and how long would it have taken for it to go from this to this, to the polished um, implement that you showed me earlier? For, to make one of these polished axe head, there is a time investment and it's uh, very noticeable. Flint is incredibly hard. It's one of the hardest stones that we can get in this country in any great availability. It scores about seven, seven and a half on the Mohs scale of geological hardness. The sandstone there is made up of quartz grains and quartz is a tiny bit harder than flint and that's that that allows you to grind it. But that's had about 60 hours wow. to grind it. It just shows you a small amount of work which is quite intense to a long period of time which is just as intense but very repetitive.